Good morning, folks. Welcome to Coffee with Artists. My name is Rachel Wilkins. Delighted to be here this morning after a brief little summer hiatus. So welcome to those joining us. To, this morning, I'm joined by a Dallas, originally from Dallas, now Brooklyn-based artist, Demarcus McCoy. Welcome, Demarcus. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Rachel. Good morning. Good morning. So you are joining us from Brooklyn. Yes. What is in that uh, co wonderful coffee cup that you have there? Let's see what you're drinking this morning. Well, I might just have coffee and milk and a little bit of sugar. <laughs> yeah, black coffee all the way for me. Mm -hmm. So you are originally from Dallas. Um, what brought you to New York? Um, I always wanted to come to New York. I used to watch this TV show called New York Undercover. And um, I was always just amazed with um, the culture of New York and um, the people and um, the art influence and the music. And my parents uh, told me like, oh, you can't go to New York until you finish college. Mm. So I went off to college and I graduated from college. And um, finally, I think when I turned 30, um, I was, I think I was having like one of my, you know, my 30 midlife crisis. And so it was kind of like, it's now, it's never, you know, mm -hmm. I was getting job offers, and I was like, you know what? If I don't move to New York, like I'm never gonna move. So I've been here like, yeah, for like over 10 years now. Wow. You're now officially, a, I think, a New Yorker at that point, once you get that 10 years. Right? Yeah, I don't have an accent though, but. I don't yeah. really hear the, the Dallas or the Texas accent with you at all. Yeah, I totally have my Texas twain. <laughs> uh, now I hear it. <laughs> so what was it about New York that you were so kind of mesmerized by what was the what was the fascination um i think it was just it was so different from from texas you know like being born and raised in texas and just uh never really leaving home it was it was different like it was um it was like exciting like to watch it on tv to hear about it and i think it was the thing of where they used to say if you can make it anywhere you can make it anywhere and i've always wanted to be one of those guys who could just make it anywhere Mm. I didn't want any limitations on myself or any boundaries on myself. I wanted to push past it. And I th think also living in Texas, I was very shy and very timid. And um, I think as maybe an exercise or something for myself was like, I have to go there, you know, mm. um, like it was, I just feel like it was just always calling me, you know, like ever since I was like a child, I just felt like it was, there was something about, uh, dreams and visions and people and just like culture that I, I wanted to experience that I had to see for myself. There's definitely a certain magic, I think, that you know, you either you either feel it or you don't. Like there's some people that I and I'm always really surprised by it like when people come here and they're like, eh, it's all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? You, you you missed the magic. Like you didn't get that there's there's something that I think draws a certain type of soul here. And I think you hit the nail on the head with, you know, the possibility, right? It's the, if you see, if you get a glimpse into that possibility, it can just ignite you and become this almost like a magnetic force. Like you have to be there. Right. And I, I certainly felt that, you know, very, very early on, on one of my very first trips here. So I, I totally relate. So now what do you miss about Texas? Oh, I definitely miss my family. Mm. Um, I miss my family. I miss the food. I miss, um, I think I just, well, I would say that like, I miss familiar faces, like just walking around or driving around and seeing people. But I get that here too. You know, it, it's funny, like since leaving Texas, I feel like um, my territory has like increased. So it's like when I, one of the things that made me feel like I belonged in New York was I, when I came here, I used to just bump into people that I knew. And I thought like, wow, like, I didn't think I knew that many people in the world, you hmm. know? And so I'm just bumping into people. And then even going out of the country, it shocked me just, again, people that I was just bumping into, you hmm. know? Um, so I would like to say that I miss like bumping into people in Texas, but I think more than anything, I miss my family and I miss, uh, I really miss my niece. You know, I really miss like playing with her, you know, talking to her. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going home in two weeks, so I get to see oh, her. Oh, nice. Very yes. cool. What do you think the kind of cultural differences are between Texas and uh, New York? You know, I, I kind of came to America very naive and thought, you know, the whole country is kind of the same, big melting pot. And I think, you know, what I've discovered is that that is absolutely not the case. 
um, that, you know, I, I almost feel like each state has, is kind of like its own little country, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's different cultures, different rules, different ethics, different, um, just a different way of perceiving things. Have you found, it, or did you find it to be a cultural adjustment moving to somewhere like New York? And what would you say are the kind of similarities and the, you know, perhaps the, the differences? Um, I think, I think um, like New York, there was a, there was a grind and there was like a hustle mm -hmm. that I was craving. Um, in Texas, I kind of felt like I was doing it and there was a small group of individuals and friends that I had that, um, you know, that we, we liked to work together. Everyone like found their niche and you were creating a circle around other people who were like doing their niche, like pretty much being in service to the world with their mm -hmm. gifts and their talents, you know. Um, but I think there became a point where it was kind of like, authentically so this is an authentic conversation so authentically there were like kind of like two things that were happening there in texas i was kind of like meeting the same a different person but same scenario mm. so it was kind of like ah, I, I just kept feeling like i was hitting this like wall like i couldn't break past this wall or this ceiling and i felt like i was limited there and i felt like in order for me to grow as big as or as large as I wanted to grow, I feel like I had to leave. I had to get like um, different experiences. I had to meet new people um, and it was scary. And so coming here to New York, it was like, I felt like I, I, I met like a whirlwind of people who were creating their businesses. They were doing their art, they were doing their music, they were doing their poetry. And I was, I found myself like emerged in this culture of people that were just doing things. And so I felt like there was no limitations on me. I felt like there was no conversations of scarcity. There was like conversations of abundance, you know, and um, there was no boundaries, you know, and I could just push past everything. And I had the potential to grow here. Um, in Texas, I will say there were moments where I just felt like, uh, I, you know, like Texas was very segregated. Dallas, well, Dallas, not Houston, but Dallas was very segregated still. So it was kind of like, I felt like I was limited on like what I really could do, or I could only go, I, like I could, I could only see myself only go so far. Hmm. Wow. You know, it's interesting that that saying, you know, you brought up the saying, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And I've, I've often kind of pondered that, like what, what did, what did they mean by that? You know, and I, I think so much of that comes from the, the grit, right? The grit of New York, like the, you know, you, it will chew you up and spit you out, right? There's, yeah. there's, it's not all glamour. It's not all glitz. Like when it's bad, it's bad. Right? So do you feel that you've had any challenges here as a creative trying to, trying to get through and, and, you know, push to make it? Yeah, uh, um, definitely. Uh, but I will say like, I feel like Texas prepared me for it. Mm. You know, um, like I remember in Texas, uh, the, the first time I opened my design firm, you know, I was like, I, I was like 25 years old and I had my own design firm in downtown Dallas in a loft and I had a staff and I had a magazine, you know? Um, but again, it's like, you could only go so far before like, you know, your business is up and running and you're doing good. Then all of a sudden it's like the landlord is like, oh, I sold the building. So you mm -hmm. have to get out, you know, and you have two weeks to get out. You know, I was constantly running into like things like that. So I moved to New York at a late age. Like I moved to New York when I turned 30 and I'm 45 mm -hmm. now, you know? And um, so I felt like Texas prepared me for pivoting and for transcending, you know, and like transform, like adapting pretty much. Mm -hmm. So um, like being in New York and like, uh, like the blackout and things like that, um, I just felt like, I just felt like Texas prepared me for it. I felt like, you know, I could either sit and I could like, not soak, but I could like sit and complain about it, or I can like transcend. I can adapt to the situation, to the situation and scenario, and I can learn from it, and I can transcend from it. And then um, those that are around me gets to transcend also as well too. So I like what you talked about scarcity and abundance. Um, 
something that I think as creatives we tend to dwell towards the former. We don't. We tend to think that there's not enough to go around, right? That we yeah. shouldn't be um, perhaps a big community because you know there's only so many collectors. Tell us a little bit more about your journey to living a more abundant life. Oh, wow. I used to have this total scarcity mindset where, like you said, like I used to feel like there wasn't enough collectors to go around. I felt like um, there were people who painted the same subject matter that I painted. It was like, oh, well, I painted Tupac too. I painted Biggie. And it's like, oh, I can't show that. You know, um, and what I learned is um, everyone has their interpretation and their perspective on things when it comes to art. Um, when it comes to collectors, as well too it's kind of like as an artist i had to learn i just had to like kind of change my mindset to like there's enough to go around mm -hmm. you know there's enough to go around and um you know like even like conception arts for instance like there are other uh programs or platforms you know, that are kind of similar that I've done in the past. But I, re I remember my friends, like scarcity. I remember my artist friends saying like, oh, I wouldn't do conception arts. I remember it. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do it, you know? And it was one of the best decisions that I made, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I've only showcased at exhibited at conception arts once, but just the, um, the community that I gained, the uh, support that I gained from you and from Renee, you know, from the staff there, like it was just overwhelming. Like all the things that have like pretty much kind of like happened, like my what's next, like it was because like I took the risk and I took the chance and I exhibited with Conception Arts, mm -hmm. you know, and um, like things just, and I, and I just sit back like, what if I was still in a scarcity mindset and I just said, no, I'm not gonna do it, you know? But I took the risk and I took the chance, you know, and, here, you know, here I am, you know, and I'm like, here I am, you know, <laughs> talking to you. <laughs> well, thank you for the, the kind words. And yes, our team are amazing. Renee is awesome. And I, and I, I hear that a lot that, you know, what, what we are able to do is, you know, provide support and community. You know, we're not this humongous company, but that's because it's always been important to us that we make you feel like you're special and you're important and you're part of this big crazy conception family because when i was an artist and i went and exhibited in shows there's nothing worse than feeling like you're kind of an afterthought right mm -hmm. i remember going to shows and you know there's one particular thing that kind of sticks in my mind was i it was like a group show and i showed up to hang my work and i was like kind of left standing there and i'm like you know where where's my spot and they left me there and nobody's kind of paid attention to me and then finally someone was like, oh, you're you're in that kind of hallway out there. And I was like, it, it, it just hit so heavy because it's like, wow, I, I really don't matter in this at all, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that can really affect somebody like emotionally, mentally. So, you know, one of the things that I always wanted to do with conception was like, there's no preferential treatment for anybody. Everybody has an equal seat at the table. Mm -hmm. No bad spots in the room. like everybody gets an equal chance to do this. And, and I, I think that because we do have such an amazing team, you know, we've really, we've really been able to do that. So I'm glad that you, uh, you joined and I'm glad that you're, you know, a part of the conception, the conception team. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, you know, again, with the scarcity and, uh, and abundance, I think something that, that that's kind of in that same vein is like, you know, the limiting beliefs that we tell ourselves, mm -hmm. like, you know, mm -hmm. we tell ourselves, like, like you said, somebody said to you, oh, you know, you maybe you shouldn't do that. Like, sometimes we can be like, just, we can limit our own progress. We can put things, we can stand in our own way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has there been any other times in your career where you, you know, perhaps ha either, either had that experience and look back and maybe regretted not taking the leap? Or can you give us an example of something where you've, you know, progressed or worked through those limiting beliefs to have, uh, you know, a certain amount of success? Yeah, I um, I used to have a lot of limiting beliefs around, oh wow, around like just my art in mm -hmm. general. Um, there was a period where I went through and I thought maybe my art was too cartoonish because um, when I was younger, I used to sketch comic books a lot. So, you know, 
Um, I thought maybe the portraits that I sketched were like immature. So I was very hard on myself thinking like, um, I know nobody's gonna like my work. Mm -hmm. Or I thought like, even when I did my pop art, I thought like, again, I thought they were like, too, it was too immature. And, um, and then there would be times where I would exhibit and I would see people who uh, like exhibited like the same subject matter that I painted as well too. So, there, so I would say, well, I'm just not gonna hang my work up. You know, I'm just gonna put my work in the back and I'm gonna hang something different because there can't be two images here, you know, the same thing or something like that. And I, and I, and I think ultimately it played on like my worthiness and it played on like, um, like the conversation that I told myself was like, my art wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Or I guess if I wanted to dig deeper, I would say like, I wasn't good enough, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I realized like, you know, I thought about like, what well, DeMarcus, is there like a fact or a belief, you know? And I realized it was a belief. And the more that I started to believe in myself and to believe into my talent, into my art, and, and even just my network of people that I knew, um, I started to realize that um, I was the person that was holding myself back. Mm -hmm. You know, like even uh, when I had my residency in Spain, you know, I had a friend, a, a, a friend, she used to do these residencies out of the country and she kind of challenged me. You know, she was like, I, she had went to Italy and I remember saying like, oh, I would love to do something like that. That would be so dope if I could do something like that. And she was like, well, I just got this residency in Spain. And I was like, oh, man, that's so dope. I wish I could do that. And she was like, well, I'm glad you said that because I just spoke to them and they said, send in your portfolio. Wow. And I was like, oh, no, I could never do that, you know? And she was like, DeMarcus, they're asking you, you know, to see your work. And I think like a week went by and she said, did you submit your work? And I was like, no, I can't do it, you know? And she said, oh, so you're still playing small. And when she said that, it was like, ah, got it. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up, I'm sending my portfolio and I ended up um, getting accepted. Wow. You know, and I went to Spain for three months. That you is know? awesome. That is amazing. So we're going to talk a little bit about residencies. We're going to shift gears okay. a little bit. Um, but before we do, anyone who is watching on a watch party, I know I have one and I think DeMarcus has one as well. Um, just to let you know that we cannot see the comments or questions that you ask on that watch party. So if you do have a question or comment for DeMarcus, make sure you jump on over to the Conception Arts page and put it on the, uh, on the comments underneath this video. And we will be taking questions at the end. So make sure that you do uh, jump on in. So let's talk about your artwork. So tell, tell us, kind of describe your artwork to us as though, you know, to somebody who's perhaps never seen it before. Um, I have uh, maybe like two or three different styles, probably like two styles, I'll say. Um, so to describe my work, my work is always like large, vibrant colors. Mm. Um, on one end, I like to paint people of color and um, I like to, I like to, I like, so my, my portraits, like this is one that I'm working on now. Um, my portraits, thank you. It, it's, so my series is called Heart to Heart. So I'm painting um, people of color and um, I'm painting their hearts. So with my life coaching background, I asked a couple of models or not, well, they're my models. And um, I asked them vulnerable questions about like just their life and their experiences. You know, have you ever had your heart broken? Have you ever been in love? Tell me about your mother. Tell me about your father. And based on their questioning, I did a photo shoot with them. Um, and so I wanted you to see the the person that I painted, but I also wanted you to look deeper and to look into their heart. And you know, like you see, the, like even now, like this when you see this strong, like powerful black woman. That's just the first layer of her her skin. But I want you to look deeper into her eyes and look into her heart to see, like. What are her experiences? What are some things that she's been through? You know, um, what is some hurt maybe that she's had? Uh, has she healed? Is she like me? Is she like someone in my family? You know, so someone I dated, um, that's that. And then I also have like my pop art. And I think my pop art comes from my advertising background. And so I do a lot of like collaging and acrylic painting um, and then, uh, like iconic type things. Like I loved Andy Warhol and I love like Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, so, and I also love like Kehinde Wiley also too. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and Amy Cheryl. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's a mixture of like all of those, but I think my first love is my pop art. 
you know, because like I love branding, and I love telling stories, and I love I think I love telling other people's stories as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe I feel like my art is maybe like love letters to the world, you know, mm -hmm. um, about other people's experiences and you know their stories. That's but beautiful. all of my work is like very, very colorful. Everything is just like colors, and I feel like colors are an expression of like life, and it lets you. It plays on like your feelings, your emotions, you know. You know that piece in the background now that you mentioned those two names. I see both Kahindi and Amy. Uh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. is very Kahindi, and the and mm -hmm. the the way the woman is presented is very much yeah. like. Yeah. So really, really awesome. The two phenomenal painters. Thank so you. You talked about heartbreak. You know, I think often we think about the artist as somebody who has to be under duress or stress or strain. Do you find that you need to be in a certain state of state of mind to create or have you at any point in your life felt you've needed to be in that sense state of disturbance to create good work? Um, recently, I kind of feel like I have. Mm. Prior to this, I didn't. Um, I'm such a, a results driven kind of guy, you know, like, oh, I need to do this. So I'll do whatever it takes to get it done. Um, when the pandemic hit, I was in a residency in Brooklyn and um, the, the, the owners of the, the, the studio where all the artists were like housed, they decided to go out of business and we had to move out like during the pandemic when like all of this was like scary, like in March and April. Um, so I had to like, you know, when they were telling us like to stay in, you know, shelter in place, you know, so I like took the risk and, um, you know, it was around my birthday. So I was scared and I was nervous. You know, I had a lot of friends who were losing like brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. Like I had like one friend, like she lost her, her father on a Wednesday and her mom on Thursday. Oh my gosh. Wow. So I was terrified. And so I just like, you know, suited up and went and got my things and I bought everything here. And I found myself like, oh, I don't have my studio anymore, you know? Even though I set it up, you know, to where I could work here in my apartment and I had enough space, I found myself, it was very challenging. Like I lost my wonderland. I lost my place to like shut the door and block the rest of the world out. Um, I wasn't able to get as creative as I used to. I wasn't able to play, I guess, should I say. And it really did like, like this, this piece, I've been working on it since March. And that's like rare for me. Normally I could like spit this out. Like maybe the longest would take a month, maybe, you know? Um, but the good thing is I found that I'm communicating with this piece, you know? Um, I'm like sitting down in front of it every day and I'm like analyzing it. That's something that I've never done before, you know? And it's like, I'm looking at the piece and I'm like, okay, what do I do? Like I'm like kind of like take my ego out of it. Like, what am I doing that's best for this piece? Mm -hmm. You know, so like I've never been as detailed with clothes, you know, like patterns, like even the background, there's like these little mini like circles, mm -hmm. you know, and I've never taken the time to do anything like that. So even though I feel like I'm not moving as quick as I would like, and I'm not able to just dive into my art as, you know, as easy as I used to, I feel like, in some form or fashion, I'm becoming a, a better artist, a um, like, again, it's like uh, the world is transitioning. So I'm transcending, I'm adapting, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm paying more attention to detail in my work. And I've always been taught like uh, the love is in the details, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm also learning like, you know, you see this one concept, but there's three different messages going on like there's the background then there's the image of the lady but then there's also the heart mm -hmm. so it's like i'm painting three it's like three different um concepts right. three different paintings in one you know so i'm taking the time to breathe and to communicate and to study and to explore and to experiment to create like better artwork i think a lot of us have had to really get comfortable with patience during mm -hmm. this right you know, mm -hmm. the, the idea of, and especially I think when you live in this, you know, the New York metropolitan area, like there's so much emphasis on being in go mode, like all mm -hmm. of the time, like it's just constant, right? 
for this to, you know, this time to kind of come out of the blue where we all have to just sit back. We have to wait. There's not necessarily a an end in sight as to when we will resume any sense of normalcy, whatever normalcy is or was. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of lessons there. What what else would you say that has come out of this experience? Um, I would say, I would say like my ability to trust mm-hmm. and um, like to trust myself, <clears throat> to trust um, the things that are around me, and to trust trust like the people that I have mm-hmm. around me as well too. Um, like, and I guess this ah, is so crazy. Like this is one of those New York things. Like I felt like, you know, like I'm in the heart of it, you know, and this is one of those things that if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And there's this thing about like being like New York tough, mm-hmm. being New York smart and being street smart, you know. Um, and it's not to say that I'm being um, like stupid and thinking that I'm indestructible or anything like that. But I feel like I have like my war stripes, mm-hmm. you know, and I feel like um, like there's no there's no limitations, you know, there's no boundary set. Like um, like I think I'm, I'm starting to see and I'm starting to believe, you know, um, I have all the tools, I have all the tools equipped to to succeed and to be and to do whatever it is that I want to do. I think at first it was always like I was looking for somebody to like save me, introduce me, because I don't have an MFA from Pratt or something like that, you know. Um, and I think I heard this like on your podcast too. I think we kind of relate with that. Um, yeah, like I, I've always had this feeling of like, oh, I don't have an MFA, like I'm not um, smart enough, I'm not talented enough, but I'm starting to learn like my journey is my journey and my path is my path and to trust in that, you know? Um, and like the things are gonna come to me, you know, like there's a there's a vision and there's a set plan and goal and everybody gets to go a different way to their destination, you know? And the way that I thought of what the roadmap was supposed to be, like that's not my mm-hmm. roadmap, you know? And I get to trust that the universe is, is putting me on the right path to my destination. Right, I love that. Talk about overcoming those limiting beliefs. Mm-hmm. And believe me, I've been there as well, you know, with the the whole MFA. I, I didn't go to art school. And, you know, there was a time where I was like, you can't call yourself an artist. You didn't go to art school. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's such a limiting belief. And, you know, most of the people that I talked to that did go to art school have told me that if they had to go back and do it again, they probably wouldn't. Mm, yeah. It's really it. interesting, you know. So I think that we, there's so much more that we can well, I shouldn't say more because I don't think it's more or less valuable, but, you know, life experience makes you a better, better artist. Culture mm-hmm. makes you a better artist. Practice makes you a better artist. You know, getting to, to the root of self makes you a better artist. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that kind of four years of education that, uh, you know, and the certificate. I agree. I agree. So let's talk a little bit about, um, your early days so okay. grew up in dallas uh your mom was a teacher mm-hmm. tell us about the early days and how your journey towards really discovering that you had this this need and yearning to be creative uh i uh that was you know that was a that was a that was a funny thing that was another like limiting belief like even as a child mm-hmm. you know um my mom was a my mom graduated from college as an education major, and when I was younger, she was a teacher. And but she ended up taking another job um, to make more money, like to support the family. Um, but I remember, I distinctly remember being in the living room, and I had this coloring book, and I was coloring. I was so frustrated because it just didn't look right. And my mom was like, "Relax, calm down." She was like, "Let me show you how to color," and she would like trace the images like dark a dark shade like with the crayon and then she would lightly color it in and I was just so fascinated because I'm like my mom knows how to color you know and I was like wow you know how do you know how to color and she was like you know baby mama's a teacher and I teach kids all the time how to do this and so that was a technique that I took with me like even as an adult like I paint like that you know I, I trace the I trace the image you know and then I fill it in you know and um 
as I got older, um, you know, I had cousins who knew how to like draw. And so I just kind of like start picking, you know, techniques from people. And then my best friend, um, Jay Corzine at the time, Jay was like this, and I've never in my life could see anyone that could draw the way that he drew, you know? So I like picked a couple little things from him. And then I think um, I stopped, I stopped, um, I stopped doing art because I felt that I couldn't, um, I think as I was getting ready to go to college, I felt like I couldn't uh, survive off of it because everyone was like, oh, you're going to be a struggling artist, you know, and this and that. And you can't make a, a living off being an artist, you know. So that was like the limiting belief that I had. Mm -hmm. And then there was this movie that came out with Eddie Murphy. It was called Boomerang. Mm -hmm. Eddie Murphy was like this exec at this uh, black ad agency. And I had never seen this before, you know. And um, his name was Marcus also. And I felt like it was a... Uh, affirmation i feel like the universe has sent me a sign like like why wow, his name is marcus and he works in this ad agency and so again i took what i knew how to do and i like switched it you know um i was i was in line in college like to register to be like a psych major and like there was this whisper that said like get out of line and i was I'm here, like get out of line like where i'm gonna go you know and my dad ended up going to the restroom and my mom and I were in line. I told her, I said, Mom, I don't want to do this. And she was like, well, what do you want to do? And I said, like, well, my, my high school teacher told me, uh, my psych major teacher told me to pick a career with something that you enjoy doing. And so I was like, I enjoy art. And I was like, I want to do advertising art. And so I jumped in line for the art majors. And I ended up getting a career in advertising art doing graphic design. So that's kind of how I pivoted, you know, I kind of like switched and it, 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 and I felt like it was the best decision that I ever made. I can't even imagine me being like a psychiatrist right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I want to know what your dad said when he came back from the bathroom. Oh, he was, pissed. <laughs> he was so upset. He was so upset because he kept telling them because he didn't understand it. Also, mm -hmm. he didn't understand advertising. He didn't understand art. The only, I don't know if you ever heard of this TV show called Bewitched. Mm -hmm. and Okay, so the only thing that he knew was Darren Stevens. So when he came back, he was like, what are you gonna be like, Darren Stevens, you know? And I was like, exactly. And he was like, no. Or Mad Men. Or Mad, well, he didn't know about Mad Men at the time. <laughs> it was a bit later, right? Yeah. So how, how was that experience? You go into advertising, you know, you still get to have, you know, use your creativity. Mm -hmm. Would you say that you learned, uh, did it kind of hinder your personal art practice or did it help? I think it eventually helped. Like I, I, I just stopped doing fine arts all mm. like in general because I just felt like the process was too slow. You know, I, I was like, I can't get anybody to, I would have to, I think what it was, I didn't understand. And I felt like advertising prepared me for, for now. Like advertising, um, I learned how to work quick. I learned how to like manipulate colors. I learned how to sell myself. I learned how to present, you know, in meetings um, to the clients. I learned how to like, even when it comes to like make like commissions, I learned how to listen to what the client wants and to implement it like in the paintings or into the graphics. And, um, and but also, I had the ability to like uh, to like put in the things that I like the things that there weren't that they weren't saying. I could hear what they weren't saying, but what mm -hmm. they really wanted. So I was able to put that into the graphics and into my paintings, you know. But I think it taught me the business side. You know, I think a lot of times, even as artists, when I speak to like younger artists, um, everyone's like wrapped up in the the talent or the creativity part, but no one wants to do like the the business side of it. You know, or or they feel that they have to like hire someone to represent them. You know, I haven't reached that point to have someone represent me yet, so I have to represent myself. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had to believe in myself. I had to speak up about myself, speak up about my artwork. I had to take the time to submit for exhibitions, submit for residencies, get my artist statement together, get my portfolio together, get my website together. So um, I feel like the advertising, um, it gave me confidence. You know, it really, it gave me confidence to do this, you know. Just from that story you just shared and also the story you shared about being online and having that voice, you know, tell you that you weren't doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're somebody who's very tapped into your own intuition. What would be your advice to somebody who perhaps is struggling with that? Um, I feel like 
I feel like take the time to like listen. I feel mm -hmm. like we all have that voice listening to us. I mean, talking to us. So what I've also learned, it took me a while to listen and to trust the voice because through different experiences and different people that we have in our lives, we are used to, my experience is that we are used to hearing different voices. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a voice that tells you, you know, you can't do it, you can't do it. Don't sign up for conception arts, mm -hmm. you know? And you have that other voice that's like, yeah, you should totally sign up for conception arts. Mm -hmm. You should totally do this. Take the risk, you know, make the investment, you know? Um, and then you have like, when you when you listen to the other voices, the, the limiting beliefs, it's that's a part of your um your worthiness mm -hmm. you know that's a part of like you don't believe in yourself like there's all kind of voices hitting us every day you know in our head but it's like which one do you choose to listen to and it, when i was younger i listened to the voice of the markets you can't do it you're not talented enough you're not handsome enough you don't have enough money you know you don't have a degree you don't have an education you know, but then I started to hear the other voice that was like, yo, you can do this. You're smart enough. You're talented enough. You know a whole lot of people, you know, and it's like now that's the voice that I choose to listen to, you know. Mm. Well, I'm glad that you did. I'm glad that you did listen to that one. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about residencies. Well, first of all, I want to say congratulations because you have just booked in to go to Chateau Orcavo. <sighs> a phenomenal residency in France that we partner with every year. Tell us, well, first of all, tell us a little bit about how that came about. First of all, I don't even know what to expect. All I know is I just want to go and I know that I'm excited to go there. Um, how I found out about it was doing Conception Arts and listening to the podcast. And at the time there was a participant that you had, an uh, artist, mm -hmm. she right. won the, uh, I can't remember her name, but she won. Andrea. The, okay, Andrea. Yeah. And I remember watching her stories and I was like, what is this place? Like it's in France and she's in the Chateau and you know, she's in the salon and she's taking pictures and they're eating together. And then, um, so I started to follow them on Instagram. And then I thought, you know, the roadmap in my head, I thought, oh, let me, let me see if I could get like conception arts to like, uh, how can I get conception arts to like nominate me to go over there to get the golden ticket, you know? Um, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know. And then I, I just like, uh, I just stayed connected to like their Instagram page. Mm. I think I started following Ziggy and I used to listen to your podcast all the time. And then one night I was working really late and I saw that you had an episode with Ziggy and the owner of mm. Marco Bob. And I was like, I gotta listen to this, you know, and I drank a Red Bull and I just like zoned out and like, and, and the more he spoke and the more you spoke, um, it was the more like I could actually see myself there, you know, and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get there. I was like, and I just declared it. I was like, I'm going to be there, you know, and then I think I even wrote it down on a piece of paper. Like um, in 2020, I will be like an artist and resident at uh, Chateau Archivo. And then I got the email that I was I was selected, but I was waitlisted. And I thought, oh, man, I'm never going to get this, you know. And then, but again, like, you know, you have these plans on what it's supposed to look like. I don't care how it looks, you know, as long as I get it, you know, mm -hmm. then I end up getting an email saying that um, you have, like, you're so, just, just selected and these are the dates that we have. Which dates would you like to choose? And I knew I couldn't do August this year. So I was like, let me choose February of next year. And so February 3rd, I'll hopefully, you know, if everything opens up, I will be in France, That's you know, amazing. February 24th. Well, promise us that you'll keep us in the loop and you'll share the videos and photographs because I'm course. a little bit jealous because I want to go there myself. <laughs> but that's all right. I'll live vicariously through you. Thanks. Well, it's interesting what you said there about you, you wrote it down and you put it on a piece of paper. You know, I'm a big believer in manifestation. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you are too. Tell us about how um, maybe some examples of where that's where that's worked out for you, and perhaps again, if that's something that you know is is uh, is a tool that you use mm -hmm. to push yourself forwards. Yeah, I think the first time I learned about um, like manifestation was uh, 
I mean, of course, when I was younger, like I was raised in church and I was taught like, you know, to pray for things. Um, but then there was also like, you know, um, praying without works is dead. You know, like you can't pray for something and then don't take action mm -hmm. in it. But I think where like it really hit me was um, I remember maybe my junior or senior year in college. I read some book. I can't remember the name of it, but it was something about like uh, these a group of friends used to write down these things that they wanted to accomplish or declare, and they would seal it up in an envelope, and one person would take all the envelopes. It was a self-addressed envelope. And then at the end of the year, whoever had the envelope will mail it back to everybody. And that, and I used to do this with my fraternity brothers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at the end of the year, I mail back everybody's letter and everybody's like, wow, I did this, I did that, you know? And I think that's the first time where I, I really kind of learned that even like getting my, um, my internship at the ad agency, it was the same way. It was like um, watching that movie Boomerang with Eddie Murphy it was like I spoke that into existence. I broke that down that I would one day work at an ad agency. And um, I remember the first, like I feel like all this stuff was kind of like the universe kind of like moved and shifted these things, you know, for me, you know, um, not for me personally, but just, I just felt like it, like it shifted. And I remember this one year uh, in college, we, my, my mate, the art majors ended up doing this like conference, this like advertising conference. We, we had, the school had never participated in anything like this before. And we, we went to this conference and we, we broke up into groups and everyone went to like different ad agencies and you worked on like a brand for the day. The, the, um, the ad agency where I worked at is, you know, for the conference is where I ended up getting my first job. Wow. That's where, I, that's where I, it's like, I feel like I manifested it, you know? Yep. Yeah, if you can see it, you can be it, you know? I 100% agree with that. So who would you say have been your creative influences over the years? Uh, ooh. Um, uh, with graphics, there with graphics, I just I felt like it was, you know, I can't really pinpoint like one particular person. I can just pinpoint like experiences, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, my travels. Like I travel a, I used to travel a lot out of the country. And I used to look at like architecture and I used to look at um, like buildings and um, I used to look at like movements and the way that like people would, um, how they live, like Dominican Republic, Spain, Portugal. Um, I think when I was in Texas, I, I looked at like Texas culture, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I painted what was around me or I designed what was around me. But when I lived in Texas, I think my outlet was New York. I would come to New York and I would see what the New York culture was and I would bring it back to Texas, you know, and I would design based off what I saw, you know, but now it's like, um, I would travel the world, you know, I would go to Spain, I would go to France, you know, I would go to Italy and I would see how they do things there. And then I would bring it back into my art, you know, um, but I would, I would say from an art perspective, um, definitely Amy, Definitely um, Kahende, uh definitely Andy Warhol, uh, Basquiat, and yeah. Well, you know what? One more person. Uh, my best friend, he passed away, his name is Tafik Muhammad. Mm. Tafik was an amazing artist. And um, even to this day, I still like look at his, his art and I look at his strokes and his shading techniques. So he probably was like my first accountability partner mm. or he's like, like he, I pushed him and he pushed me vice versa. So even today, I'd probably say he's probably still one of my um, my greats that I, that I grab energy from. Well, first of all, I'm very sorry for your loss, um, for your, you know, losing your friend. I did read something interesting, though, that you had uh, an unusual exchange with a medium not too long after his passing. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. I forgot about, I forgot about that. Um, I... So I felt like Tafik was like the, um, I felt like he was like the activation of me painting again because I was in my comfort zone of designing and I had no interest in painting whatsoever. And um, I had a friend, she challenged me to start painting again. And once I started painting, I felt like maybe he was kind of guiding me, but I wasn't like, you know, sure. And I traveled from New York to Texas and I ended up just going to this party, 
and this random, this random girl just walks up to me. I've never seen her in my life. And she says, um, 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 she said, I'm sorry. She said, you don't know me. I don't want you to you know, freak out or anything. And she said, but I have a message for you. And I was like, a message for me? Like, she was like, I'm a medium. And um, someone wants me to give you a message. And she says, I don't know um, if, she said, I don't know like the person's name. She said, but uh, you, you two are around the same age. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time I was getting his, his, uh, his his uh, art photograph because I was creating. Uh, I had promised him we were working on like a coffee table book of his artwork, so I was getting all of his images, his paintings, um, um, photographed the next day. And she said, "There's she says there's someone that's speaking to me that wants me to tell you um, that there's a there's a she said I don't I don't know what it means. She said, but there's an art piece. You're not sure if you are supposed to take it or not. And the answer is yes." And I said, oh, I, I totally believe in like mediums, you know, um, I said, oh, that's my best friend, Tafi, you know, and I was like, okay, I said, thank you for telling me that. And I was like, wow, I can't believe it, you know, and when I picked up his work from his sister's place, I didn't like, I was like, you know, I'm just going to take everything. And literally his niece called me and she said, DeMarcus, I, I know you're going to get his artwork um, uh, photographed. She said, I have this piece that, that Tafi created. And I don't know if I should like give it to you or not. It's in my place. And I was like, boom. I said, that's the piece. I said, yeah, like bring it to me. I said, and I, and I explained to you kind of like what someone told me. So even with like my art and my residencies and all the exhibitions, I kind of feel like he's um, guiding me mm -hmm. and he's like speaking my name, you know, to like people, he's whispering my name into places to give me opportunities, you know, that I just never even, opportunities to A, that he never had, and B, opportunities that I never had, you know? So I'm definitely appreciative to that. It's incredibly powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Absolutely. So what do you hope that people take away when they experience your work? What do you, what do you hope they're, that they, um, you know, their reaction is and that they experience? Um, well, I want them to, I want people to like look at my work and to I want them to, to have some type of feeling. I want them to, to be able to look at the colors and to know like their eyes are working. Mm -hmm. I want them to, to see the vibrant colors and to see the strokes and, and I want them to, to, to see the colors and to like feel a certain type of energy and it lets them know that um, they're alive also and that they're feeling, you know, they're feeling something. I want them to see the textures, that I apply in the paint. And um, even though I don't want them to touch it, I want them to want to touch my right. art and to let them know that they can feel. You know, ultimately I think um, I want to let, I want to let like my viewers know that they're alive. Like you're here, um, you have a purpose, you know? Um, there's like, I always tell people like, um, you're uniquely designed. Like there's only one you, like there's only one Rachel, you know? and um, no one can do what you can do, you know, and it, like it's your duty to to use your gifts and use it in service to the world to make the world a better place, you know, and my art is me in service to the world. My art is um, letting you know that you're alive, like um, that you still have breath and that um, there's something that you know how to do. You know, I'm trying to empower you and motivate you and inspire you to use your gifts to you know, better service the world. It's a beautiful and well said sentiment. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. So folks, we are going to take some questions for Demarcus. So if you do have questions, do jump on into the comments. Once again, if you are watching this on one of the watch parties, uh, just remember that we cannot see your comments if you comment in a watch party. So jump on over to the Conception Arts page. Um, and while you're there, go ahead, if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and hit subscribe. Um, if you are an artist out there, go ahead and download our freebie, which is attached to this video, which is um, seven steps to help you uh, get more uh, eyes on your artwork. Um, and obviously, uh, feel free to share this, this video and spread the word, the word even about Demarcus's amazing artwork. All right. So what are your aspirations going forward, Demarcus? What do you hope for the next kind of five years when it comes to your artwork? Mm, I... I think my ultimate goal is I my ultimate goal is I want to be a billion dollar artist. And um 
and I think with that, um, whether I'm alive or not, you know, I want to be a billion dollar artist. I want my art to go for like a billion dollars. And <clears throat> I would like for that, I guess my intentions for that is to change the trajectory of my family mm. to make my family billionaires, you know, to um, so that they would have like financial freedom to do any and everything that they want to do mm. in life. And then also for those who are like investors of my art, owners of my art, like it makes them billionaires and millionaires as well, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, that's like my gift, you know, to create some type of like financial freedom and for you to take that freedom and to create something that will make like this world a better place. Like the ideas that you have, the talents that you have, the people that you know to take in and ultimately create that organization, create that um, nonprofit, create that service that you provide, you know, use that talent that you have and make the world a better place, be in service to it, you know? Um, but I guess like short term is, um, I would love to be like, I guess I will just like a serious artist, you know? I would love to see my work in um, museums and galleries. Um, I would love to go deeper into my art. Um, to showcase like internationally more, mm -hmm. you know, um, to be able to dive deeper, to tell like deeper stories, deeper um, expressions, you know, of life. What would you say has been the highlight of your career so far? So many, like, ah, uh, there's just, I just feel really blessed. Like there's so many. Um, you know what, I'll, no, okay. I'll say the first piece that I ever sold. Mm. That was the highlight. And and I sold it for the exact amount of mm. what I decided that it was gonna be. Um, that was just like, like it wasn't anyone trying to finagle me on the price. It was like, oh, you're selling it for over a thousand dollars. Okay, yeah, like I'll pay for that, you know, because like I was worth it or they valued it, you know. Um, and it, I, you know, I guess it, it, it spoke to them and, um, that gave me the confidence to, they gave me the confidence, you know, to, to know that I matter, to know that my art matters. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I think it also like the other artists that were, that were around me at the time, I think it gave them permission as well too, you know, um, like, like even though I won that night, I think we all won. And that was like a very like uh, highlighted moment because even with like I, I spread it the love that night. Mm -hmm. So even though I won, I ended up like purchasing prints. You know, I, I sold a painting, so I purchased prints and you know pins and other merchandise from some of the other artists that were on the road that I was exhibiting on. So it was like we all had a sense of winning. It wasn't just like oh I won and I'm by myself. It was like no, we all going to win. You know, if I win, you win. You mm -hmm. know, and um, that was just one of the best moments of my life. You know, that was I think good. we'll always remember the sale of our first painting, right? Yeah. I love that you talk again about the 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 abundance there. You know, you you didn't just kind of take this moment, this um, you know, highlight this, you know, where somebody had invested in you and just kind of like put a wall in front of it. It was like, no, let me let me pay this forward. Let me mm -hmm. invest in my peers. Let me you know spread this this love basically, which is you know exactly what you did. And I think that there's a, there's a big lesson there in how we can, uh, you know, all uh, be a little better and a little kinder to one another, for sure. Yes. All right, so we have a question here from Valerie Thomas. Um, first of all, Valerie says, powerful statement, I appreciate your authenticity, and I'm bananas about your art and expression. What advice would you share with upcoming artists that will help them build trust with themselves? Great question, Valerie. Um, great question. Thank you. Um, I would say to, I would say take the risk, you know, take the risk to, to trust and believe in yourself and to believe in your talents. And like I said earlier, we all have, um, different voices to us and we, we are already equipped with the tools that we need to succeed. You know, um, it's like you have a toolbox. I always tell people you have a toolbox and you have all these different tools in there, but um, you're used to using the screwdriver. 
-hmm. and you try to take the screwdriver and you try to make it a wrench and you try to make it a hammer when you actually have a hammer in your toolbox you actually have a wrench in your toolbox like all you have to do is select it and choose it you know so i think if you just choose to trust yourself and to trust your art then um the more it will feel right the more you can trust it. and you probably don't trust because you're not used to hearing it. You're not used to trusting it because you're probably used to trusting the, oh, I don't believe in myself. I'm not good enough. You're used to hearing that. So learn to listen to the other voices. Great question and a great response. All right, so let's let people know where they can learn more about your work, Demarcus. What is your website address? My website is, <clears throat> Ah, so it's, it's pretty much my first name, last name dot com. Okay, so All right. So, thankfully, I have your name on the screen so I can spell it correctly. Oh, uh, thank you. All right. Yeah. So, folks, go, do go check out Demarcus's work. And, um, you know, if you're interested in a piece, make sure that you reach out. Um, and just any any final thoughts that you want to leave us with, Demarcus? Um, I'll just reiterate it again is that um, every single person in the world. Um, you were uniquely designed, and um, there's only one thing that you know how to do better than anybody else in this world. And it is your duty to take this gift and this talent that you have and to use it to make the world a better place. Um, it is your duty. Don't wait for anyone to to notice you or to give you permission. Give permission to yourself to use this gift and to use this talent. Word. <laughs> you appreciated. Amen. <laughs> thank you so much this has been a thank pleasure you. wonderful to spend this time with you this morning so thank, thank you, you. absolutely all right folks that is it from us for today thank you so much for tuning in for joining us um if you're catching this replay again do go ahead and hit that subscribe button and share this video where you can and of course go check out demarcus's amazing work on his website that is our show today folks thank you for being here